going to talk about causes of cancer today. And I have nothing to disclose, no conflicts of interest to disclose. So specifically what I'm talking, going to talk about, we're going to start off by, again, talking about what is cancer. And I'm going to focus more on a molecular genetic perspective of what cancer is. And we'll, we'll differentiate between sporadic or common forms of cancer versus inherited cancers. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about different types of genes that prevent and cause cancer. And these are called tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. And I'll go through a few examples of those. And then we're gonna talk about how mutations occur in these genes that lead to cancer. So we'll start off with um, kind of think about what cancer is and the different sporadic versus inherited cancer. So first of all, so I want you to think about one word that comes to mind when you hear the word cancer. And I see inevitable, which is a very interesting um, way to, to, word to think of for cancer. Scary, growth, worst diagnosis, death, cellular chaos and aggression, adaptability, scary, another scary. So clearly there's a lot of fear around cancer. Sneaky, that's a good one, sneaky. Metastasis, when cancer spreads, death sentence. So hopefully you'll learn that cancer is not always a death sentence. And um, the more, more we develop new treatments, hopefully it will become more of a chronic disease in many cases. Certainly it is life-changing, that is no doubt. That is no doubt, okay. So I'll just say from my perspective, when I think about cancer, of course, I think about everything I'm gonna be talking to you about today. But a common theme of all cancers is that they arise from uncontrolled cell proliferation. So cancers arise from uncontrolled cell proliferation, as I said. So our organs and our tissues normally maintain what we call homeostasis. And homeostasis means that the organs and tissues maintain the same number of cells. And they do this by carefully regulating processes of cell proliferation and cell death. And another term for there's different types, different um, ways that cells die. And one way is called apoptosis, which is a, a programmed cell death when the cell intentionally commits suicide because there's something not right and does not want to spread that. So our, our, our cells are carefully regulated to control the um, cell proliferation and cell death, such that the number of cells that are born exactly equal the number of cells that die. So we have the exact same number of cells maintained. Now, what we're looking at here is a picture of a cell. It happens to be a fibroblast cell that um, is, we're looking at it through fluorescent microscopy. And what you see in the green is in the cytoplasm of the cell, there are these, um, microtubules basically in the cytoskeleton of the cell. And what's in red here is the DNA in the nucleus of the cell, just to orient you there. So how, is a, how does a tissue maintain um, homeostasis? So we, normal cells have these safeguards to control different uh, these processes. So there are growth factors also called mitogens, and that's because they induce mitosis, which is part of the cell division process. So these growth factors promote cell proliferation. And likewise, there are growth suppressors that block cell proliferation, and they are in careful balance with each other. Similarly, there are death signals that promote cell death and survival factors that inhibit cell death. So you can see there's all these safeguards and regulatory mechanisms that are very carefully balanced to make sure that our cells divide only when they should divide and that we have a careful balance to maintain the exact appropriate number of cells. Well, what happens when mutations disrupt these safeguards and we have too much cell proliferation, then we have a tumor formation. So a tumor forms as a result of a disruption of normal tissue homeostasis. So we have too much cell proliferation and little or no cell death. The net result is too many cells. So the important take home point from this is that cancer development represents a progressive destruction or you lose those safeguards that I talked about. 
And you then have these properties that allow the cell to survive, divide, move to distant sites, which is metastasis, and do all the things that they shouldn't be doing. Okay, when we use the term cancer, we generally mean a particular type of disease that can affect various organ systems and tissues of the body. But as you've already learned from the first session, cancer is truly a collection of heterogeneous diseases. So theoretically, there can be as many tumor types as cell types in the body. And there are around 200 different histologic cell types that have been identified in humans. So theoretically, there are 200 different types of cancer. So all these types of cancer share some common cell um, biological characteristics. So at the cellular level, they have some similar characteristics and they share a similar pathogenesis or a mechanism of actually developing into a cancer cell. But yet, even though they share these common characteristics, each individual's cancer is unique. So with each and with molecular technologies, we're finding out just how different cancers are. So no two people have the exact same version of a disease, whatever that disease is. And that is particularly true for cancer. So an understanding of the molecular profile of cancer can often provide information about the prognosis a more exact diagnosis of prognosis and treatment options. So what all these different types of cancer, you know, the, you know, heterogeneous collection of diseases, what they have in common is that they involve inappropriate cell proliferation. So the cells are, are dividing when they shouldn't and more rapidly when they shouldn't and perhaps in different places, places and they move to different sites and they're growing in places where they shouldn't. So how do cancer cells acquire the ability to proliferate when they shouldn't? Well, at the root cause, as I say here, cancer is a genetic disease. So that doesn't mean that it's all inherited, but cancer is due to the accumulation of genetic mutations in genes that are involved in those regulatory safeguard pathways that I talked about. And so that they disrupt the normal tissue homeostasis. Now we know that from early observations that have been demonstrated um, that, that there is a lag time between the exposure to a carcinogenic agent or something that causes cancer and development of cancer. So this was elucidated through, um, through many tragic events like the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. Uh, the radium girls you may have heard about during World War II, they, would um, paint the watch dials with luminescent paint and they would lick the tip of the paintbrush to be, have very precise um, painting on the watch dials and many of them developed head and neck cancers. And there are examples with um, nuclear meltdowns like Chernobyl and, and other places. So these are all you know, devastating situations and we learned a lot about cancer from these instances and we learned that there's a lag time between the exposure and the actual development of cancer. And we now know that what is happening during that lag time is the accumulation of, a different, of additional mutations that disrupt these normal safeguards and uh, lead to cancer progression. So I'm illustrating that here in this diagram. So these circles represent cells. This one, this uh, white circle out here is just a, a normal healthy cell that then is exposed to a carcinogen or something that induces some damage and causes a mutation, disrupts one of those normal safeguards and allows the cell to start dividing, gives it some proliferative advantage. Well, then as this cell is dividing, it can acquire additional mutations that give it an additional advantage. And then some of those cells might acquire another mutation that knocks out a different safeguard, et cetera, et cetera, until you've knocked out enough of those safeguards in order to grow and to proliferate and form a full-blown um, full cancer. So what this is illustrating is that the process of cancer development is multi-step process. And what happens during those steps is that multiple mutations are accumulating. And that is illustrated here as well using an example of colon cancer. So we're looking here at the surface, the interior surface of the colon. 
and you've learned some of these terms, and don't worry about the terminology too much, but we have a normal epithelium. Epithelial cells are cells that line um, the surfaces in our body. So in the, the interior of the um, esophagus and the, G, the stomach and the, the um, GI tract, your skin, these are all epithelial cells. So what we're showing here is that there, it's a stepwise process to you first have a hyperplasia where the cells start to divide more than they should. And then they become more uncontrolled and it develops into a, a smaller polyp and they can develop into larger polyps and become more and more irregular until it develops into a full-blown cancer. And what you can see with this dark pink part here is that this is then metastasizing. It's, being, it's leaving this site and going to get into the bloodstream or, and start to travel to, to other sites. So this is illustrating that at each of these steps in the cancer development process, there are additional mutations that, um, that allow the cells to progress into these uh, further and further along the cancer pathway. Okay, so I've talked about how cancer is a genetic disease, but yet it does not mean that all cancers are inherited. So the vast majority of cancers are what we call sporadic. These are common cancers that result from the accumulation of mutations in these cells that are in these, excuse me, genes that are involved in these safeguards that a person accumulates over a lifetime. And it's a lot of, of um, kind of bad luck in a way of just kind of genetic luck of where, what mutations you're acquiring and if someone acquires mutations that lead to um, cancer development. And there's a complex interaction between genetic and environmental factors that lead to cancer development. And sp common sporadic cancers are typically developed in an older age, in your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Whereas inherited cancers are less common in the population overall, they account for only about 10% of all cancers. However, in the families where they have an inherited cancer syndrome, the cancers are very common indeed. So these are due to an inherited susceptibility. Um, so there's a particular germline mutation in a gene that leads to the cancer susceptibility. And what this does, it, it gives the tumor a head start. So these individuals that have this cancer predisposition tend to develop cancers at a younger age and they are at risk for multiple cancers throughout their life. So I'm illustrating this here. Um, so recall from that other image where I had the circles with the cells and there was a, a white cell that was a, um, a normal um, wild type cell. This, these red cells here, like the red cells in that diagram that have the first mutation. So this case, in this case for a familiar inherited cancer, individuals start with one of these mutations in all the cells of their body. And so they have a head start in this pathway. So they keep acquiring additional mutations, but they've already kind of have a head start in that pathway. So therefore there's a higher risk of tumor development and a risk of multiple tumors. And again, at a younger age, because you have this kind of head start in the pathway. Okay, so now we're gonna talk more specifically about the types of genes that are involved in cancer development. So what type of genes are involved in cancer development? Well, these are genes that can be divided into two broad categories. And we talk about tumor suppressor genes, which as the name suggests, they these are genes who the proteins that they encode inhibit cell proliferation. They suppress tumor growth. That's their normal function in the cell in our bodies is to inhibit cell proliferation and prevent tumor formation. The other category of genes are oncogenes. And these are those that promote cell proliferation. And we need to promote cell proliferation for wound healing and you know many other things we need to, to be able to, um, certain cells need to proliferate. We just want them to proliferate at the appropriate time and only as much as we want them to and need them to. So again, tumor suppressor genes are those that inhibit cell proliferation. Oncogenes are those that promote cell proliferation. So these um, tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes act through three major processes. 
So the first is that they can play a role in directly in regulating the cell cycle. So that means that turning the cell cycle on, the cell is growing and dividing into two cells, and then those cells can divide into further cells, et cetera. So these genes are directly promoting or inhibiting cell proliferation. The other process um, is controlling cell death. And there are genes that both promote cell death and genes that prevent cell death. And the third process that's um, involved with cancer development is repairing DNA damage. So if damage is not repaired, mutations can accumulate, and that is a bad thing that can lead to um, in promoting cell cycle. So that in more indirectly affects cell proliferation. So tumor formation is promoted by defects in these genes. I'm gonna talk in more detail about um, the function of these genes. So I want to give you a visual example of how these genes affect cell proliferation and cancer development. So I want you to consider the analogy of a car as a cell. So here's our cute little VW bug. That is our, our cell, our normal cell. Now, normally um, we have the gas pedal and we have brakes and we need both a gas pedal and brakes to be able to drive safely down the road, right? We need to move the, to the gas down to move forward and stop when we need to stop, speed up when we need to and slow down. And when our brakes and our gas pedal are working properly, we're just fine. So oncogenes are like the gas pedal. They move us forward when we need to move forward. Tumor suppressor genes are like the brakes. So they're stopping. And so once again, we have both the brakes and the gas pedal working properly. We're moving forward just fine in a very controlled fashion. But what happens when we lose the tumor suppressors, so we lose our gas pedal and or our gas pedal is stuck down. So our, sorry, I think I said the wrong thing before. So our, when our brakes are lost or our gas pedal is stuck down, in either of those cases, we go, go, go. The cells are growing and proliferating uncontrollably. So in addition to having our, our gas pedal and our brakes, we also need to make sure that our, our cars are, are um, running smoothly, right? So if there's like a little oil leak, it might not be a big thing, but if you don't fix it, it's gonna be a big thing. So that is, there's another type of genes that are involved in DNA repair. And these are often called caretaker genes. And these are like the mechanics. So mechanics are just making sure that our genome is, everything's okay with the genome um, because little problems can turn into big problems. And when these genes are mutated, that results in what we call the mutator phenotype because now our DNA repair systems are not working. So you're accumulating a lot more DNA damage that's not being repaired and then results in, um, in more mutations. And some of these mutations are in tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes that allow cells to proliferate when they shouldn't. So let's look at how, what this, how this happens in cancer. Um, so I'm gonna just show you this diagrammatically. Um, so this a circle here is a cell and these two blue um, little lines here are chromosomes and our genes are packaged into our chromosomes here. So I'm just showing you and to remind you we have two copies of every gene. So this is illustrating um, two copies of the same chromosome. And for example of our oncogenes, remember our oncogenes are like the gas pedal. And we actually only need one of those gas pedals to get stuck down in order to cause the problem. So we have two copies of the oncogene. And if there is a mutation that activates or turns on one of these copies of that gene when it shouldn't be on, that's enough to start moving the cell into um, the tumor progression pathway. Whereas for tumor suppressor genes, again, here's the circle is our cell and the two chromosomes, and we have two copies of this tumor suppressor gene. Well, with our tumor suppressor genes, they're like the brakes, and we have front brakes and rear brakes. And for the brakes to go out completely, we need to lose both the front and the back. So similarly, we need to lose both copies of a tumor suppressor gene in order to completely lose the brakes on the cell cycle. And then that puts us into the tumor progression pathway. All right, so let me just summarize some of the things that I've talked about. I know this was a lot 
coming at you. So to summarize what we talked about with tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes. So tumor suppressor genes inhibit the cell, cell proliferation. They can act directly to inhibit the cell cycle. Um, so there's blocking the cell from dividing directly, or they can promote cell death. So either case, they are inhibiting cell proliferation. There are also tumor suppressor genes that are involved in DNA repair, uh, repairing DNA damage. And for tumor suppressor genes, we, you are inactivating or losing both copies in the case of cancer, and that leads to unregulated cell proliferation. For oncogenes, these are genes that promote cell proliferation, and they can act directly by promoting the cell cycle. So where the tumor suppressors are inhibiting it, the oncogenes are promoting it. So they're turning it on directly so the cells start dividing. Or oncogenes can also block cell death so that if the cells are not dying when they should, the net result is accumulation of cells. And in the case for oncogenes, a single copy is activated in cancer. And again, you re result in unregulated cell proliferation. So a fun little um, factoid here, some little trivia, is that uh, we had two very famous um, faculty from UCSF that won the 1989 Nobel Prize for discovering the cellular origin of oncogenes. So before this, it was believed, it, well, there were many different theories of the cause of cancer from you know, viruses and many other things. It was thought that it was something from the outside, more like an infectious agent. And what my, doctors Bishop and Barmas showed that it actually is from in the cells, that it, there are normal genes that become hyperactive that lead to this overproliferation. So this was a, a very important finding that really moved forward the, um, the field of cancer research. And so Dr. Bishop actually went on, he also received the National Medal of Science in 2003, which is a very prestigious award. And he served as chancellor here at UCSF from 1998 to 2009. And he's still a professor emeritus, he's still around. And Dr. Harold Barmas, went on to direct the NIH from 1993 to 1999. And um, then he was the director of the National Cancer Institute from 2010 to 2015. He was appointed by, Dr. Uh, by, <laughs> by President Obama. Okay, so we talked about how cancer is a heterogeneous collection of diseases that's caused by an accumulation of mutations in tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes, right? And although each cancer is different, we said how they share certain features. So these features we call the hallmarks of cancer. And that's illustrated here. Don't worry about all the terminology. I'm just putting this up here to illustrate these different features that are shared by most cancer cells. The different, yeah, different hallmarks that allow the cell to grow and divide when it shouldn't and move to places and live in, in, you know, in distant sites, et cetera. And this actually, these hallmarks of, feature, of, of cancer were described by Drs. Hanahan and, and Weinberg. And Dr. Don Hanahan was here at UCSF. And there is Dr. Hanahan and Weinberg are both very well respected researchers and, and did a lot of pioneering work in, in cancer research. Um, and Dr. Hanahan was here for most of that. And he's now running an institute in, in Switzerland. Okay, so now I'm just gonna share with you a couple examples of tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes to just put a couple names to, um, to them. So the first tumor suppressor gene I'm gonna share with you is called TP53, or you might have heard of P53 as the, as the protein that it encodes. TP53 is often called the guardian of the genome, and that's because it plays a major role in maintaining the integrity of our genome. So its major role is to respond to DNA damage and help signal the pathways to repair that damage. If this gene is lost or inactivated, it is a major player in moving forward the um, tumor progression pathway. And in fact, it is lost or inactivated in more than 50% of all sporadic common human tumors. And it's probably much higher than that because we're discovering different ways that tumor suppressor genes can be inactivated. And um, so it's much, it's likely much higher than that. TP53 is also involved in a 
cancer um, predisposition syndrome called leaf raumani syndrome. And in this case, there is a germline mutation of TP53 that is inherited from one generation to the next. And patients inherit one copy of this TP53 gene. It's called, they have a pathogenic variant or mutation in that gene. And that gives them a very strong predisposition to many different cancers. And these individuals develop cancers at a younger age, typically younger than 45. So this is very devastating for uh, these individuals. And they are prone to develop bone cancers, breast cancers, brain tumors, leukemias, or blood cancers, um, and cancers of soft tissue like muscles um, and, and several others as well. So they've inherited one copy, but remember tumor suppressor genes, you have the front breaks and the rear breaks. You need to lose both of them in, in, to um, promote tumor progression to tumor formation. So these individuals have inherited one copy. And when, if one of one cell loses a second copy, then that cell can start to proliferate when it shouldn't. And that's why they have this predisposition to cancer. Another a tumor suppressor gene you may have heard of is BRCA1. There's actually two of them, BRCA1 and BRCA2. And these genes are involved with familial and hereditary breast and ovarian cancers. And they are also inherited in a, in a dominant fashion. So it's, it's passed on from one generation to the next. And you see cancer in every generation. Uh, these these genes encode proteins that normally function to repair a very specific type of DNA damage called double-stranded breaks. So if you recall that our DNA is double-stranded, we have a double-stranded helix. So there's two strands that are bound together. And if there is a break that goes through both strands, that's the type of damage that these repair. And this is a very, um, very dangerous type of, of DNA damage. So this is a very important um, repair system. And so mutations in these are, um, again, involved in uh, responsible for familial breast and ovarian cancer. And individuals are typically diagnosed less than 50 years old. Um, and these are also mutated in many sporadic breast and ovarian cancers. And in individuals with breast and ovarian cancers, where they don't have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, there are other genes that work with BRCA1 and 2 in the similar pathway that are seen to be, um, they're often mutated. So it can kind of like they have friends that they all work together. So if any one of them is disrupted, it can have a similar effect. Okay, now I also talked about the mechanic, the, the um, repair genes, DNA repair genes. So one type of DNA repair is called mismatch repair. And this repair system fixes when there are mistakes, when a, the wrong base is put in when DNA is, um, is replicated or some other process that, that changes a base. So there's a mismatch in that base pairing. And this mechanism repairs that, that type of um, damage. And when you lose this repair system, you have an accumulation of these mutations across the genome some of those mutations will end up being in, in tumor suppressor genes or oncogenes and lead to, um, to cancer syndromes. So in this case, uh, this is often an early step in the development of sporadic colon cancers and germline or inherited mutations in one of these repair genes is associated with Lynch syndrome, which is a um, cancer predisposition syndrome, mainly colon cancer. These individuals have very high risk for developing colon cancer, as well as uterine, stomach, prostate, and other cancers. And the mean age of onset is in the 40s, but these individuals with Lynch syndrome can develop cancers in as early as their 20s or even in their teens. Okay, so I also want to mention an oncogene, and um, probably the most important oncogene is RAS. And RAS actually gets its name, it was uh, first identified in rats, in a rat sarcoma, a type of cancer in a rat. So it was uh, called RAS after the rat sarcoma virus. So there are three different RAS proteins in humans that are expressed in different tissues and mutations. So remember it's an oncogene, so it's the gas pedal. So a mutation in RAS in this gas pedal puts, um, keeps it in its active state. 
So it no longer turns off when it should turn off. So it's kind of like your foot on the gas pedal. If the gas pedal is stuck down, it doesn't matter whether your foot is there or not, it's stuck down. So once this RAS is turned on, it doesn't matter if there are gross signals telling the cell to divide or if they're not there, it's still going to go ahead and divide. RAS is found to be um, mutated in about 30% of all dominant, of, of all, um, excuse me, of all common um, tumors, of all human tumors. And it's found in a very high percent of certain types of cancers like pancreatic cancers, 90% of pancreatic cancers have a RAS mutation and 35 to 50% of sporadic um, colon cancers. So there are, no, um, there are no cancer predisposition or inherited cancers associated with inherited RAS mutations because if you were to inherit one copy of that gene, that's all you need. So probably just, uh, you wouldn't, you'd have tumors form, forming in utero, basically. It's not, not compatible with life. Okay, so we've talked about um, sporadic versus inherited cancers and the different types of genes that cause cancer, tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes and their roles in cell proliferation and cell death. So now I wanna talk a bit about how cancer causing mutations occur. So how do mutations in these genes occur that lead to development of cancer? All right. So we talked about the genes again that are in, that are altered in cancer, and so how do mutations occur that that lead to cancer? In a nutshell, they result from the accumulation of DNA damage. Now our cells are amazingly efficient in repairing DNA damage. We are bombarded, as we'll talk about in a moment, with different types of um, you know, things that cause us uh, DNA damage all the time. You can even think in your GI system, you know, all the things that were being ingested and everything that's happening in our body and UV light and everything. And you know, it's really remarkable how the vast majority of that is repaired. But if there is a loss of a repair mechanism, so those, those genome caretakers, those mechanics, if we lose one of those mechanics, then it's a problem. So then we have unrepaired DNA damage that can accumulate. And the more damage that accumulates, the more likely it is to have mutations in critical genes. And then that leads to what is called genome instability, that you are starting to acquire more and more mutations. So I'll just comment that you know our, our genome, the vast majority of our genome is called non-coding. So the actual component of our genome that, that is encoded by genes is only 2%. So 98% of the genome uh, is doing other things. It's kind of regulating the, the, the turns on and off the genes and does other things that we're still learning what that all does. But it also can absorb some of the DNA damage without you know, causing problems. But the more damage that accumulates, the, the more likelihood that you'll have damage that are causing mutations in these cancer-causing genes, and then cancer results. Okay, so before I talk further about DNA damage, I want to briefly orient you to the structure of the DNA and mind you, the DNA double helix. So you probably have all seen this type of figure before. It's our um, DNA double helix wrapped around. So what is a DNA double helix? Well. There's actually the two strands, as I mentioned before, the two, two stranded um, helix. And you can see this blue part here is a sugar phosphate backbone. And then what comes um, off of that backbone are these bases. And these bases are adenine and thymine or T, adenine A, thymine T, guanine G, and cytosine C and they pair together in a very specific way. So A pairs with T and T with A, and G pairs with C and C with G. And, um, and that's the only way that they pair. So, um, and so when you, we have like the sequence of a gene, what we're reading is A, T, G, A, C, et cetera, just reading those bases along uh, the strand of DNA. So how does DNA damage occur? It can occur spontaneously or just randomly, um, both within our cells and from our environment. So there are 
alterations that can happen to our DNA bases. There are when a DNA replicates, different errors can occur. Again, most of the time these are repaired. There are byproducts of normal cellular metabolism like free oxygen radicals that can cause oxidative damage. Again, most of the time it's repaired, but sometimes it slips through. Um, there are environmental causes, uh, UV light, cigarette smoke, there are chemicals in cigarette smoke, other toxic chemicals in our environment, things that we ingest, et cetera, that can damage or alter our, our DNA. So as an example of the spontaneous damage that can happen to our DNA just within our cells every day. So here's our DNA double helix here and showing in a little more detail showing right here is one of these base, there's a base pair. There's one um, partner on the other strand over there and here's one base. So I'm blowing that up here to show you this is that sugar phosphate backward bone I talked about, and this is the base. So this is a cytosine, and this is an amino group here. So it's not that important, but just to show you what can happen is just spontaneously in our cells, this cytosine can become what's called deaminated or lose this amino group. Well, then it's not a cytosine anymore. It becomes a uracil. Uracil is not normally in our DNA. Uracil is in RNA, but not normally in our DNA. So this is going to make a change in the DNA sequence. And this is something, this deamination or changing a cytosine to a uracil is actually quite a common occurrence. Um, it occurs like to 100 bases per cell per day. So this is something that's happening to all of us, you know, all the time. Again, this is typically repaired by a particular type of uh, repair system. So to just show you how that, if it's not repaired, what happens? So what I'm showing you here, this kind of gold lines here is the is are the backbone of the DNA, and here are the the bases. So normally we would have a G and a C, but when that C is deaminated and it changes to a U, well U does not pair with G, and then when it is this strand is replicated, you end up putting in an A that can pair with the U. And then the next round of replication, this U is gonna be changed to the partner of A in DNA, which is a T. So what happens after two rounds of replication, instead of having a GC, you end up having an AT. So that is a, a big a change to the sequence. The take home message is that if there's an altered base and it's not repaired, it leads to a mutation that's maintained in the DNA. Now, normally this right here is a mismatch that would be repaired by a mismatch repair mechanism that specifically looks for these types of mismatches or this mismatch, I should say right here, that typically that looks for this little bulge that there's a mismatch and repairs that. Okay, so from our environment, there are many different types of, of mutagens or things that cause mutations. Um, one example is in a cigarette smoke. So there's a chemical that's called benzoapyrene um, that's in tobacco smoke that forms an adduct on our DNA. So it basically, it kind of distorts the structure of the DNA and that causes major problems when the DNA is trying to um, replicate. And another type of damage is from UV, UV light. And that also causes kind of a, a, um, a structural damage to DNA. What happens is the, so I told you how the bases pair from one strand to the other in a very particular way. Well, what DNA, what UV light does is cause bases to pair within the same strand. So instead of pairing to their partners in the complementary strand, they're, they're binding to each other in the same strand that forms a kink in the DNA, which again is a major problem when the DNA is, when you try to replicate through that. So there are different types of DNA repair systems that um, repair specific kinds of damage. So here we have our mechanic. There are different mechanics. You know, they each have their own very specialized roles. So like, for example, I talked about the, the mismatch with the, you know, when there was a U put in instead of the C, for example. Um, and don't worry about the different types here. I just want to let you know that there are different types of DNA repair systems. And when these, and they, work very efficiently to maintain the integrity of our genome. But considering that we have like 3 billion cells in our body and every time they're dividing, it's 
pretty remarkable that we don't actually don't all have cancer at a very young age. So we really do have efficient um, repair systems. But of course, as someone said early on, when you think of cancer, you think inevitable. You know, some people will say, well, if you live long enough, you'll develop cancer. Um, but our DNA repair systems, I do want to give a shout out to them because they do work amazingly well. And so these, again, are our caretaker genes. So what happens when we lose our caretakers? That is when we accumulate more DNA damage, as I've said before, and I just wanted to illustrate this for you in this graph. So if we're looking at what this graph is showing on the um, x-axis is the number of mutations and the y-axis here is the um, time. So we're just thinking about as cells are dividing that you know, there's a low background rate of, of mutations in our genome. And most of them don't cause us any problems at all. If there's loss of a DNA repair system, then all of a sudden you have a whole lot of mutations that occur. And that's when the cell is called genetically unstable, which is a characteristic of advanced tumor cells. And in fact, the mutation rate in cancer cells is typically 10 to 20% high or 10 to 20 times higher than it is in um, a normal cell. So again, cancer cells acquire many mutations once you lose DNA repair. Okay, so coming back to this figure that I showed earlier, um, I, if you recall this, this multi-step process of the tumor progression pathway as it's been mapped to colon cancer. So what I'm showing you here, there's all the, the steps and we talked about how different mutations occur in different safeguards. And so we now know that there are these tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes along the way. Once you lose DNA repair, and this is thought to be an early step in the process of um, colon cancer development, once you lose that and you increase genome instability, then you start to accumulate all these other mutations that then lead to a full-blown carcinoma. Okay, so I want to summarize um, what I've talked about thus far. So I've talked about from the beginning how cancer results from genetic mutations that disrupt these normal tissue homeostasis. So disrupts the, the processes that control the, the normal number of cells and tumors arise during this multi-step process of accumulation of multiple mutations. And the mutations are in genes that are involved in cell proliferation, cell death and DNA repair. And it is the inactivation or loss of tumor suppressor genes and the activation, so that the inactivation or loss of the, of the breaks on the cell cycle um, and the activation of oncogenes or sticking down the gas pedal that causes the problem and leads to uh, tumor formation. Cancers, although they are a heterogeneous group of diseases, they all share certain hallmark features. And we talked about how random DNA damage is constantly occurring due, due to normal cellular processes and environmental factors. Most DNA damage is repaired by specific repair mechanisms but it unrepaired damage leads to mutations that are maintained in our, in our genome. And if you lose a DNA repair mechanism, that leads to the accumulation of a lot more mutations and that leads to what's called genomic instability and the potential to acquire many more mutations, including those in um, critical cancer genes. And genome instability is believed to be an early event in tumor progression that allows for the acquisition of all these other mutations. All right, so I know I went through a lot of information in a short period of time, so I'll be very happy to, to address your questions. But first, I want to kind of segue to sessions uh, later in the course. So why is all of this important? Why is it important to understand the molecular basis of cancer? Well, it's important to have a more accurate diagnosis and, and prognosis of the disease. And you're gonna talk about diagnosis uh, next week. As well, it gives us information. This is a huge area of, of research and clinically applied uh, research is developing targeted cancer therapies. So once we know this particular gene is turned on when it shouldn't be turned on, well, maybe there's a way that we can target that to block it in the cancer cells specifically. 
So, um, so to, yeah, so this is a big area of, of research is developing targeted cancer therapies. And this leads to more precise and individualized cancer treatment, as you'll learn much more about later in the course. And with that, I thank you very much, and I will look forward to taking your questions. That was excellent, Dr. Highland. Thank you so much for that overview. Um, Kathy, I'm gonna um, send this first question to you. This is the question uh, states, how does CRISP, it just came through. So how does CRISPR technology factor into cancer prevention, particularly in people who are particularly susceptible, such as those who have Lee from any syndrome? Great question. So CRISPR technology or gene editing um, has huge potential. We're not there yet. There have been some, you know, as we know, there's some, some successes. So we're really hopeful that this may be a way of helping, you know, in the future to correct when somebody has an inherited cancer predisposition, a very specific mutation, to be able to correct that mutation. Um, so we're not there yet, but hopefully the technology will be, will be able to be used in cases like that. I am, um, I, as we're waiting for more questions to come through, I have a somewhat just simpler question as someone who is so, um, uh, you know, has a PhD in this specifically, how do you look at the world and how do you consider protecting yourself from DNA damage in the world? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I certainly wear my sunscreen. As you can tell, I need it. <laughs> I'm very high risk. Um, so yeah, just being, you know, aware of things like that. But of course, you don't want to walk around, you know, live your life being worried about everything. But I think just, just being aware. I mean, I, I am someone that um, eats very healthfully. I'm very aware of what, of, of what I ingest and eat very, you know, natural foods and try to avoid processed foods and things like that. So somebody asked uh, in the Q&A about um, blood-based assays um, to detect cancer early. And I, I just wanted to address that and say a couple things. First of all, we'll cover blood-based assays in the final session of the course. Um, so you'll learn more about that. But I do want to connect that concept of a blood-based assay to Dr. Highland's talk. Um, so uh, for those who haven't heard of these, uh, when we think about molecular testing for cancer, we traditionally have done that testing on the tumor itself. So someone will get a biopsy as you'll learn more about next week. And then there are various tests we can do on that biopsy on that tissue specimen to learn about the molecular features of the cancer. Um, Blood-based assays are a pretty cool, fairly recent development where uh, you can draw somebody's blood just through a standard blood draw and there are elements of the cancer that can be detected sometimes through that blood test because tumors, cancers in the body, sometimes shed things into the bloodstream. And you'll learn much more about that in our final session of the course. But um, often the things we're looking for on these molecular tests and including those blood-based assays are some of the same genetic mutations that Dr. Hyland was talking about earlier. Um, that are pretty specific to different cancers. And through looking for some of those mutations through a simple blood draw, we now sometimes have the ability to figure out that somebody has cancer and even what type of cancer it is, and even what treatments might be helpful for somebody with that cancer. So these blood draw um, assays, these tests have come a long way. Um, the person who asked the question was asking about detecting cancer early. Um, right now, we're using these blood-based uh, tests primarily to examine features of cancer in someone who we already know has cancer. Um, it hasn't quite hit prime time yet to use these blood-based assays to detect cancer early in a reliable way, but the, the research is really promising, and I have a feeling that we'll be doing that in the not-too-distant future, um, and there are already some companies working actively on this. So just wanted to address that question and I'll toss it back to Dr. Aurora. Thanks, Dr. Brownfield. Um, so Dr. Highland, there seems to be, I think a, a, I found a few questions. One of the questions was in the chat, so I'll just ask that one. Um, is there any study on how not process, processed food of nutrition affects cancer? I would assume, you know, meaning if one consumes a heavy amount of non of unprocessed food, um, does it affect cancer growth? I think that's what they're asking in the question. 
Um, so I don't know about the, the studies. I'm not up on the current literature on that. So I don't want to um, misspeak about anything. Um, but in, in general, it's, uh, there are studies about nutrition and lower risk for, for cancers. And I don't know if, um, if either Dr. Bronfield or Aurora know anything more specifically about that, but I do know that, um, you know, like just having a healthy diet with fresh vegetables and, you know, whole grains and all that are shown to reduce risk of, of certain types of cancer. Do you guys, do you know anything more specifically? I'm happy to comment. Um, there, it, there's not strong data out there to strongly recommend a particular diet or against a particular other diet to prevent or treat cancer. Um, we do, as Dr. Highland said, generally recommend a healthy diet for people with cancer and to just minimize the chance of cancer over someone's lifetime. There are suggestions though that diet may be linked to certain types of cancer. Um, for example, the prevalence of gastric cancer and colorectal cancer, both gastrointestinal cancers, are different in different parts of the world. And the theory is that someone's diet in different parts of the world may have something to do with that. Um, but again, in terms of general recommendations, we just recommend a generally healthy diet and diet does not seem to be a very strong contributor to cancer risk uh, for particular cancer types as compared to other risk factors. And I think just an important part of that too is that if one were to be diagnosed with cancer, diet doesn't seem to change at all the growth patterns of that cancer once, once it has already developed in the body. Um, but I agree that the suggestion is the strongest with things that are um, originate in the GI tract. Dr. Helen, I'll go to this um, question next. Um, I think it's a you know a question we probably all wonder about. What's the time frame between DNA damage and mutations and full blown cancer or the diagnosis of a cancer? So it's not there's not he can't really say like one time frame specifically, um, and it's going to depend on you know what the um, mutations are that occur. So they've just shown for. Um, you know, people that were exposed to radiation or something like that, there was like a, a decade, seemed you know, like a couple decades. But for people that had large exposures, it would be a shorter time frame than, um, than you would just naturally acquire mutations over your whole life. So where someone might acquire, a, develop a cancer in their 70s, someone that had an exposure might develop cancer just like two decades after that exposure, something like that. Um, but as far as just like, you know, the typical DNA damage that we're exposed to, it's really just like an accumulation over our lifetime. And it depends on the type of cancer. Certain cancers are more dependent, and without going into too many details, are more dependent on certain oncogenes or, or um, tumor suppressor genes that play more of a role. And if those happen to be mutated, then that cancer might develop um, faster. And in someone else, if those mutations don't happen, then it's a slower progression. So I know it's a very loose way of, of explaining that, but it's it's very dependent on the type of cancer and the mutations involved. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm gonna to toss this question to Dr. Brownfield. Um, so does Oncotype DX test score test only oncogene for breast cancer and prostate cancer? That's a great question. Um, I have uh, learned some about the Oncotype DX score, mainly in the setting of breast and prostate cancer. Um, I am not aware of it being used for other cancer types, but that may just be the limits of my knowledge, so I'm not entirely sure. Um, but just to make sure others know what we're talking about, uh, Oncotype DX is a, a gene panel that is used in uh, breast cancer uh, primarily to look for common mutations in breast cancer. And it can tell us something about how aggressive we expect the disease to be, its responsiveness to chemotherapy. So it's another example of a test that can be done on a cancer to help identify some molecular characteristics about it that really impact diagnosis and treatment. Thanks, Dr. Brownfield. Um, and Dr. Highland, I'm gonna ask you, did you wanna comment on something? I see another question that's kind of uh, related to that. If you don't mind, if I can jump forward uh, one question to this one I'm seeing in the Q&A, is the molecular profile of all patient tumors now routinely evaluated prior to treatment decisions 
um, or is or is this done only for certain types of cancer like breast cancer? So I just wanted to jump in with that question because it relates to what Sam was just talking about. And uh, so Sam, you can say more about this, but we here at UCSF, there is the UCSF 500 tumor panel, which is not done on everybody, but it's, it's often done on people, not just breast cancer, on many different types of cancer to give information to see, are there certain um, genes that are mutated, certain oncogenes, for example, that if they are mutated, it might indicate that a certain type of targeted therapy could work for that patient. Um, and Sam, do you wanna say anything more about that? I, I think I would just echo what, uh, what Dr. Hyland said, that clinically we're using uh, broad molecular testing panels all the time in cancer now. Um, I would say in most cases, especially of advanced cancer, we are uh, sending these broad molecular panels. Um, you will learn more about these molecular panels in our next week's session um, about how uh, we diagnose cancer, so much more to come there. Um, but yes, we're using it quite a lot. Um, while I'm unmuted, I will just also uh, address a comment that I saw in the chat um, in response to comments about diet um, and cancer. Someone brought up the really important point about um, what's the relationship between obesity and diabetes and cancer. And I'll just answer that by saying that um, diabetes for sure is important in relation to cancer um, in that diabetes is a known risk factor for pancreatic cancer. So um, yes, in general, maintaining good health, um, avoiding uh, obesity and reducing uh, body mass index and uh, reducing one's risk for diabetes will also reduce one's risk for cancer. So that is an important link and one reason why we generally recommend a healthy diet. Thanks. Um, I'm going to ask this one um, next and then I'll go to the other question because it was in the chat a little earlier. I think to um, I'll leave it open to either of you to answer, but um, there are several types of breast cancer. I've heard that a testicular cancer can be closer to one of those breast cancers than two types of breast cancer. How does that work? So that kind of comes down to the molecular profile. I'm going to have uh, Dr. Bronfield add to this as well, but there can be certain um, mutations that occur. Uh, and this is where cancers are more grouped by their molecular profile sometimes than, apologies, there's another dog barking across the hall and my dog is totally triggered now. So sorry about that. Um, but so there, if, if different types of cancer have a more similar molecular profile, they actually may act more similar than another cancer of like that same cell type. So two breast cancers, might be more different molecularly and a breast cancer. And what was the example? Um, I forgot if it was a prostate cancer or something else. If they have more of the similar molecular profile, meaning similar oncogenes turned on, similar tumor suppressor genes turned off, they'll respond to a, a more similar treatment um, plan. So Dr. Bronfield, do you wanna say more about that? Sure, um, that was a great answer. I I'll just uh, add that uh, currently when we talk about different types of cancers, as you've heard, we usually refer to them by the organ that they originated in. So breast cancer, testicular cancer, but as Dr. Highlands described, and as you'll learn more about next week, um, in fact, a cancer that originates in the breast, for example, can look very many different ways. It can be uh, one of a number of subtypes of breast cancer. There are other soft tissue cancers that can start in the breast. So there's a whole variety of types of cancer that can start in a particular organ. And I'm not aware of one that looks particularly like testicular cancer, um, but testicular cancers or cancers very similar to them can start outside of the testicle and other organs as well. So I think the theme here is that yes, we name different cancers by the part of body that they uh, start in, but there's all sorts of different subtypes within that. And you'll learn much more about that next week. I liked this question, um, and there's one really good crystal ball question that I thought I would leave towards the end of our Q&A session, if that's okay. Um, but this next question, um, and, and I'll ask Dr. Hyland to, order, um, to answer this. If a mutation occurs, does it change all of the DNA in one's body? That's a great question. The answer is no. So it depends. So a mutation might occur in just one cell. Um, there might be different mutations, you know, in different cells. But unless that mutation is in a germ cell, so in the egg or the sperm that is then inherited, so you know, produces a, 
offspring and next generation. In that case, it is maintained and then it would be inherited in the, the child's DNA in all of their cells. But if a mutation occurs in you and just one of your you know, organ cells, it is not everywhere, it is just in that cell. Thanks. I think it's a really important concept to um, take home because we get so many questions from people asking, does this mean that I have a genetic mutation that might, you know, are my, are my kids going to be affected by this? Um, and it's really rare for um, those types of mutations to cause, um, it, it is rare, that's a, that's a small subset of cancers overall for those, the types that are one's mutations that you're born with. Um, so another question, while cancer has been around for a very long time, what do you attribute the increase in cases to in the last century? And I think um, it would be great for an answer from, from both of you. Well, one thing that comes to mind is that um, people are living longer. So, you know, the longer we live, the more likely it is that we'll develop cancer. So that that's one, one part of it. Um, and, you know, actually, Dr. Bronfield, I want to see what, how you're going to respond to this because you know there are certainly different things in our environment and different things that we're exposed to, and um, whether there are truly more carcinogens that we're exposed to than in previous than a century ago um, is is a good question, or whether it's really has more to do with that our population is aging. Yeah, um, was as the audience might remember from Dr. Aurora's talk last week. The trajectories of different cancer types are are pretty variable and in fact lung cancer is uh, going down and that's probably because people are in general smoking less um but why are some cancers going up um or why have they gone up or spiked uh, in recent years you may also remember dr aurora showed a graph of um, prostate cancer and that one went up really suddenly uh years ago and the, probably the biggest reason behind that is more testing for prostate cancer. So not necessarily that the, um, the number of times it's happening in the population is going up, but that we're just finding it more often. So the answer, I think, overall is pretty complicated and depends on the cancer type, but I think it's multifactorial. Some cancers are increasing, for example, colorectal cancer, that may have to do with diet, um, some are going down, lung cancer, like we talked about, and some we're detecting more often because of better testing technology. So a complicated question and a, a really good one. All right, I will leave the crystal ball question now. And thanks everyone for your great questions. We still have time, so feel free to add some more questions to the Q&A. Um, but, and I think this question will be great for both of our, speak, um, for Dr. Highland and for Dr. Bronfield to answer today. Um, if you had a crystal ball, where do you see cancer diagnoses and treatment in the next 5, 10, 15 years? Which cancer, if any, could be 100% curable in the future? Dr. Bronfield, are you looking into your crystal ball? Yeah, um, that, that is a fantastic question. Um, and there's a couple questions in there, I think. It looks like the first one is, where do we see cancer diagnosis and treatment in the next 5, 10, 15 years? And the second one is, um, can any cancer be 100% curable in the future? So uh, my thoughts on that, uh, just taking it a piece at a time. So diagnosis in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, as you'll learn about both next week and in the final session of the course, there are multiple um, new innovations in the diagnosis of cancer that have happened recently and are continuing to happen. So a couple of the big innovations are uh, better imaging techniques that uh, take advantage of certain molecular features of cancer. So we're just getting better and better at detecting even very tiny deposits of cancer in the body by imaging. Um, so that should continue to improve over time. Uh, molecular diagnosis, as we were talking about earlier, not only through biopsies of cancer, but also from relatively straightforward blood tests. And the more you can detect and the more information you get from a simple blood test, the easier things go in general, because it's a relatively non-invasive test to do. So probably more advances in that. I do think we're going to start to see early detection of cancer through blood testing, um, which we talked about a bit earlier, but has not reached prime time yet. I think that that will come in the not so distant future. Um, treatment in the next 5, 10, 15 years, treatment's just constantly evolving. And we'll talk a lot more about that in uh, two weeks from now. Um, and you'll also hear uh, probably about some advances in treatment in the final session of the course too. 
Um, I might leave that just for those sessions because it's a, a big question, but to summarize, there's a lot of cool advances in treatment that are ongoing. Um, and then the last part of the question, which cancer, if any, could be 100% curable in the future? Um, it's always hard in medicine to talk about 100% or things that are certain. Um, there are some cancers that we consider highly curable now and will probably become even more highly curable in the future. Uh, a good example is testicular cancer, one of the most highly curable cancers out there, but still not 100%. Um, I don't know that we'll reach 100% curability for a particular cancer type um, anytime in the near future, but I think we're just going up and up and up and getting better and better. Um, so I think that's the best answer I can give for that. And any other thoughts, uh, Dr. Highland? I was just going to ask, what about um, some leukemias and lymphomas? And with some of the new therapies for those, they're pretty darn successful. Dr. Yeah. O'Rourke is perfect to answer that one. Yeah, that's absolutely what I was thinking about too, Dr. Highland. In our um, you know, leukemia and lymphoma world, we have made you know, huge advances in the last few years, especially with immunotherapy for cancers that previously had been completely refractory to our standard therapies and even things we had on clinical trial suddenly are curable after someone has, you know, unfortunately relapsed on five lines of treatment. Now we can cure them with CAR T or bispecific T cell engagers. Um, so leukemia, it's totally changed the game in leukemia and lymphoma and in myeloma. There's been several new, um, and you'll hear about this as well in, um, I believe one of our last sessions, um, specifically about immunotherapy, really exciting, hot topic um, and a really cool kind of drug that's being used initially started to be used in the hematology or the blood-based cancers or liquid cancers, but is also being used as well in solid organ um, malignancies. And we have a lot of clinical trials at UCSF and so that stuff's exciting. And so I know that you're gonna have a whole session on uh, cancer treatments and you know the, the new breakthroughs. So um, you'll learn a lot more about that, but I think this is an area that is just so exciting with immunotherapies coming out and more targeted therapies. So when we talk about targeted therapies, I, um, I'll just to, to clarify what we mean a little bit more that typical chemotherapies, we're just kind of hitting any dividing cell, which is why people would have um, a lot of nausea and you'd um, a lot of diarrhea from the, you know, it hits the GI tract and you lose your hair and, you know, all the other side effects because it was just hitting every dividing cell. So targeted therapies are those that are trying to target just the cancer cells versus um, the non-cancer cells. And so the more we understand the molecular profiles of different types of cancer, and then figuring out, and not just the, the molecular profile, but understanding the biology underneath and why targeting one molecule will work versus targeting another molecule won't, um, you know, developing better targeted therapies, I think is really going to help in the next you know, decade, I'd say. Thanks, Dr. Island. Um, I think we have a few uh, additional questions. I missed one in the chat, so I'll ask this um, to Dr. Broadfield. Does staging mean stage four means death is imminent versus com as compared to when someone gets diagnosed with a stage one cancer? Great question. And we throw around this term stage or staging all the time. Uh, you will learn more about that next week in our diagnosis uh, session. But just to answer that, um, stage one to stage four uh, does not uh, describe how some how close somebody is to the end of their life. It instead describes how advanced the cancer is in the body. So for example, in general, a stage one cancer is a single tumor uh, in one part of the body, often that can be surgically removed and potentially cured whereas stage four generally means metastatic or spread beyond where the tumor started. In fact, usually to distant sites in the body that are pretty far from where the, the cancer started. And that is most of the time not a curable scenario. So the stage really matters in terms of what the next steps in treatment are, um, but it doesn't describe how close someone is to the end of, the life, of their life. It just describes how advanced the disease is uh, within the body. And you'll learn more about that uh, next week. Thanks. And I'll um, toss this question, um, I think, to Dr. Highland. And you know, feel free to um, ask Dr. Bronfield as, as well. Um, and maybe both could answer. But what cancers can start from the breast other than breast cancer? So I think so. Um, 
Dr. Bronfield, I'll have you chime in as well, but I believe, so from my understanding of, of the cancer starts from the organ that it starts in. It, so I, to flip your question around a bit, a cancer that's, that's a breast cancer can move to a distant site and can be someplace else, but would still be breast cancer cells. Now, what other cancers can start from the breast? Only breast cancer can start from the breast. But if a breast cancer cell moves to someplace else, so you have a metastasis in the bone or a metastasis someplace else, it's actually breast cancer cells placed in that other area. But to my understanding, you can only have breast cancer start from the breast. Is that correct, Dr. Bronfield? Thanks, uh, Kathy. I'll, I'll just add uh, one thing, which is that I agree that most of the time uh, when a cancer, when a tumor starts in the breast, that it is one of the sort of more typical types of breast cancer that we see. There are unusual scenarios, some more common than others, where we're really surprised by a biopsy result from a tumor in the breast. Um, a couple examples. One is uh, certain types of soft tissue cancers called sarcomas can start in the breast. There's, a, there's one called a phyllodes tumor. And that one, when we get that result out of a breast tumor, it totally changes the approach to how we would treat that cancer that started in the breast. And we don't usually even call that breast cancer because the type is so different from the typical breast cancers that we see. Another example is that rarely lymphomas can start in the breast as well. And those are examples of blood cancers that Dr. Aurora treats that can start in many places in the body, but occasionally in the breast. So I think the take home message there is we may do some imaging and find a cancer or what looks like a cancer in the breast. And most of the time that's going to be a typical type of breast cancer, but sometimes there's some really rare types that can start in the breast that surprise us and are treated quite differently. So great examples, Dr. Brownfield. Um, and um, we have a, a fresh question in the, in the Q and A that I think I will um, pass it to Dr. Brownfield. Um, how is a distant recurrence differentiated clinically from a second primary? I think it's a great question. It is a great question. Excellent question. And uh, I'm not sure we'll answer that in another session, so I'm glad you asked. Um, so uh, what we're referring to here is that uh, let's say that someone has a cancer and the cancer gets treated, and then they don't have any more cancer in the body to our knowledge, but then down the road, uh, a cancer appears again. And the question in that scenario is always, is this a new, totally different cancer, or is this a part of that first cancer that maybe the treatment didn't get 100% of it, and now it's coming back in, say, a different site? Um, the way we distinguish those scenarios is through a biopsy, typically. We want to actually get a piece of that tumor, and again, you'll learn about biopsies um, next week, but we want to get a piece of the tumor and examine it under the microscope and potentially do some of the molecular testing that Dr. Hyland was alluding to earlier around some of these genetic mutations. And through that testing, we can usually pretty accurately identify, is this a totally new cancer or is this that same one that's just coming back? If I can piggyback on your, your answer to just connect with something that I said earlier when I was talking about um, how, why people who have familial cancers are at risk for multiple tumors. They're actually at risk for multiple primary tumors to use the, the terminology because all the cells of their body have the, the initial mutation that predisposes every cell to, you know, towards the, the tumor progression. So you can have different cells acquire different mutations and develop into multiple primary tumors. So you can both have metastases and primary tumors. So, but when we say that people with inherited cancer syndromes are at risk for multiple tumors and multiple primary tumors and, and different types of cancer. So someone might have um, uterine cancer and colon cancer or something like that. Thanks, Dr. Highland. Um, we have another question, which I think is also, these all have been such great questions. I would like um, to ask Dr. Highland to, to answer this. Um, can cancer treatment such as chemotherapy or radiation increase the chance for developing other cancers down the line? And maybe to add to that question, why? That's a great question. And again, I'm gonna ask Dr. Bronfield to, to follow up. Um, so, and this has been a, a challenge with treating childhood tumors in particular, you know, using radiation for childhood tumors and a concern whether there would be 
um, cancers later in life. So um, there is some risk with radiation. I think that radiation treatments have gotten much better and very focused. So there is less risk of that than in you know decades ago when radiation was just kind of given in, in broader dose, larger doses and broader areas. Um, and chemotherapy, I don't believe that chemotherapy really will cause cancers in the future, but I'd like to hear what Dr. Bronfield says. Again, I think where we're moving now is towards very, you know, targeted treatments, both with radiation being physically more targeted and, um, and targeted therapies that have less and less risk of, um, of for future cancers. Dr. Bronfield. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I, I will correct one thing and say that chemotherapy definitely is linked with secondary cancers down the road, um, as is radiation. Um, the way that this happens is that both of those types of treatment can impact and cause mutations in DNA, just like the ones that Dr. Hyland was referring to earlier. Um, typically, uh, cancers that result from uh, prior treatment from chemotherapy or radiation take many years to happen. Um, usually something like a decade or, or longer. Um, there are some types of chemotherapy that can cause cancer uh, or sooner than that. Um, when that happens, it's usually a leukemia and can happen from certain types of chemotherapy within a couple years of getting prior treatment. But these, these secondary cancers down the road are rare. They're not common events after chemotherapy or radiation, but they are really important things to know about uh, in anyone who has received any radiation or chemotherapy. Great. Well, it looks like we've, I, I thank you everyone for the great questions. I'm so glad that we were able to talk back and forth after Dr. Hyland's excellent presentation. I learned a lot from your presentation, Dr. Hyland, and your slides were just were really beautiful. So look forward to learning from them for years to come as well. Thanks everybody. And thanks Dr. Hyland for coming. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you.